Maryland men's and women's lacrosse both fell short in the regular season finales while softball dropped its series with Penn State this weekend. But the Dirty Terps won their 19th straight Big Ten series. We'll recap all of that and more coming up on the left bench. It's tournament time, so it is. If you, if you lose, you're done. Just what an outstanding job you did, unbelievable. Welcome to another edition of The Left Bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. Alex Gary joined alongside by Alana Mutnik. And Alana, as you mentioned before, Maryland sports kind of had an up and down weekend this weekend, but there's only one way we could start off this show, talking about the rivalry. Yeah, Alex, and when the Terps and Blue Jays meet up, it is always must-see TV, and this Saturday's affair was no exception. Number three, Maryland, and number seven, Johns Hopkins with the Big Ten title on the line. He can't draw it any better. Maryland got on the board first with a Daniel Maltz goal, but Johns Hopkins fired back quickly with two of their own. The Terps notched two more goals and led 3-2 to two at the end of the first quarter. Later in came Nick Red with his first career goal, increasing the Terps' momentum. Then Brandon Irksa flung two shots into the back of the net while the Blue Jays scored four more to put them up one after, by the, one after the third. Maltz tallied another goal to tie it, but Johns Hopkins responded. Two more scores and the Blue Jays led by a pair. With 54 seconds left, Maltz added his fourth of the night, but that would be all. The Terps couldn't pull off the rivalry win or claim a share of the Big Ten title as they dropped this one 12-11. And that's really the goal this week is, you know, just kind of go look at, see what we didn't do well, uh, realize where we are. Um, it's tournament time, so it is. If, you're, if you lose, you're done. Um, so hopefully that sense of urgency uh, helps, but hopefully we grow from this because um, obviously that's a great atmosphere, uh, very similar to probably what we'll see down the road. Well, to talk more about the rivalry loss and what's next for the hard shells, we now welcome on Brandon Schwartzberg, who covers the team for the Diamondback. Brandon, as always, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on. So let's start off with, uh, first with the face-off troubles. Now, Luke Weirman kind of struggled against uh, the Blue Jays, going 13 for 27. Is this going to be a problem for the Terps moving forward, do you think? I don't think it's going to be a problem. He's had some off games so far this season, but he's still one of the best face-off specialists in the nation. He's top 10 in face-off percentage. He, he's been really such an impactful piece of their offense because of how inefficient they've been. They struggled to get goals on a lot of their possessions, so they've, need, they've needed to rack up as many possessions as they can get. And so Weirman at the face-off face position, he's going to be vital as the season goes on. And if Maryland wants to make a deep run in the Big Ten and the NCAA tournaments, they're going to need Weirman to be at the top of his game to do so. Yeah, and let's, let's talk about Saturday again. So we know Johns Hopkins is circled on the Terps' calendar every year, and this was their first loss in the rivalry since 2019. So what do you think this disappointment did for the momentum heading into the postseason? Yeah, you know, I think it's a setback. Uh, Tillman talked about after the game, they just have to – it's a new season, basically. It's you win, you keep going, you lose, you're out. And so they just have to get back to it. I mean, they, they didn't have a long, any long win streaks this season. The longest was three games. And so they really haven't gone on a super long stretch where they've looked dominant. And so I just think that they've got to get back to what they were doing in those winning stretches, especially against Rutgers in the first three quarters, which was unselfish offense and then team collective defense where they really looked great. And now you said Rutgers. That's who their opponent's going to be in the quarterfinals, or the quarterfinals of the Big Ten tournament. What does Tillman's squad need to do to get ahead of this one? Yeah, I think they have to get out to a fast start. Um, because they've been so kind of run heavy with their offense, they need to really get off to a 3-1 start, a 4-1 start, something where they get the field going early and can continue it as the game goes on. Because as you saw with the John Ho Johns Hopkins loss, there was a lot of back and forth. Either team scored more than two goals in a run, and Maryland just can't win those games this year. They're, they just don't have the talent like they did last year. And so I think the key is like they did the last time, to get off to a really good start on both sides of the ball because then you can have, say, a fourth quarter like they did last time where the offense wasn't great, the defense was okay, but they still ended up winning by three. Yeah, now looking ahead to the NCAA tournament, the ACC is stacked with teams like Duke, Virginia, Notre Dame. So 
Do you think Maryland is ready to face some of these non-conference juggernauts again? Yeah, um, I think they are. I mean, the thing about Maryland is they're battle-tested. They've had a rough schedule. They beat Virginia in overtime. They lost to Notre Dame in overtime. And so they've played that high-end caliber teams close. It's It's been the teams that you wouldn't expect them to play that they've lost to or, or played close. I mean, the Michigan loss was bad. The Loyola loss early in the season was bad. But when they've played against the top-tier teams, they've stepped up to the competition. And so I think if they could just work, figure out a way to play like that every time out, they shouldn't have a problem. And, I, again, I just think if they can find, find an offense, a consistent offense, and then keep the defense going, they should be in good shape. Yeah, definitely. Well, Brandon, thanks so much for joining us. And maybe the next time we have you back on, we'll be discussing the Terps' success in the postseason. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And you can make sure to uh, keep up with Brandon's coverage on Twitter at BrandonSchwartzberg03 and read his work at dbknews.com. The Maryland baseball bats were hot all weekend long, and the Terps stayed near the top of the Big Ten standings. The Terps did not start off hot as they found themselves in a 7-1 hole after a four-run top of the sixth put Maryland behind. But the Terps would not go away without a fight. The Dirty Terps bats lit up in the sixth and seventh in part to a bomb from Eddie Okopian. Ian Petrutz continued the run later, putting the Terps within striking distance. But the Boilermakers maintained a narrow lead to take game one and mark the Dirty Terps' first Big Ten Series opener loss this season. In the second game, Maryland found themselves playing catch-up again, but they needed their big hitters Nick LaRusso and Matt Shaw delivered. LaRusso hit a three-run dinger to put Maryland in front. In the next at-bat, Shaw said, anything you can do, I can do better, and extended the lead. The pitching efforts of Kyle McCoy, Kenny Lippman, and Nigel Belgrave kept that Boilermakers at bay and gave the Terps a 6-5 win in Game 2. After trailing early in Games 1 and 2, the Terps broke out to a hot start scoring five runs to the Boilermakers' one through five innings. And Maryland just kept pushing with homers from Eddie Okopian, Elijah Lambros, Luke Schliger, and Ian Petrutz. Purdue tried sneaking back into the game late, but it was too little, too late, as the Terps won 10 to eight. You know, when we sent him out, I was like, okay, well, let, maybe he can get us two, let us get through the lineup once, and, and then we can turn it over to the next guy. And he just kept rolling and kept telling us he felt great, so we were able to keep going with him, and just what an outstanding job he did. Unbelievable. Exactly one year ago this Saturday, the Dirty Terps laced up their cleats ahead of a Friday night matchup with Northwestern. But what happened next was beyond anyone's imagination. Judith Altnew explains. Almost one year ago, fans at the Bob got to witness one of the rarest feats in sports, a perfect game. There's no words for that, you know, just an incredible performance. A nine-inning perfect game had only happened 23 times in the MLB and 19 times in college, until Ryan Ramsey added his name to the list. In a game that featured 13 runs, Ramsey's domination through Northwestern's lineup went a bit unnoticed in the early innings. After the seventh inning, it was the bottom of the seventh, we got back in the dugout, and I looked at the scoreboard just to kind of what I always do, and I saw a bunch of zeros, and I was like, well, that's interesting. Once Schliger realized Ramsey was doing something special, he sensed the moment, but tried to keep the same approach. I think there was a little bit more urgency in the eighth and in the ninth to just grab some of the balls that might be fringy, ball strike, and make them into a strike or present them well. Thanks in part to his rapport with Schliger, Ramsey finished off the 20th perfect game in NCAA history, inducing a ground out for out number 27. Easier when your, your catcher is on the same page with you and understands you know, your pitch sequences, what you're, what you're favoriting, um, and knows how to talk to you, especially, you know, there's sometimes you'll have mound visits, um, and sometimes in between innings as well as you need to talk to your catcher about how you want to attack the next next lineup of hitters. In a historic season for Maryland baseball, Ramsey's perfect game was another accomplishment on a long list that included winning the Big Ten regular season title and hosting a regional for the first time in program history. The Kansas City Royals drafted Ramsey in last year's MLB draft, and he's currently pitching for the Columbia Fireflies, the Royals high A affiliate. Yet the perfect game has followed him. My teammates now even ask about it. You know, what was it like? Were guys talking to you? You know, when did when did people start to get quiet? Uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a cool thing to bring to 
the next level. Yeah, Alex, I was at that game last year, and let me tell you, it was probably one of the most surreal moments I've ever experienced at the Bob, so I can't even imagine what it was like for the Terps. Yeah, and it kind of shows how critical he was to that team next year, because when you look at the pitching rotation now, they're kind of struggling a little bit. He was really a critical asset there. Yeah, and speaking of critical assets, Maryland basketball has lost one of its key pieces to the transfer portal. Philadelphia native Hakeem Hart announced Friday that he will be using his final year of eligibility to head home and play for Villanova. Hart spent the last four seasons in College Park joining the Terps at just a 17-year-old. The 2023 All Big Ten Honorable Mention tied for second on the team with a career best 11.4 points per game last season. He started in all 35 games as a senior, shooting 47.9% from the floor. Hart ultimately chose Villanova over Miami, Gonzaga, and Kansas, and Kevin Willard used the scholarship from Hart's exit to sign Champ Stevens, a Loyola Marymount transfer with three years of eligibility remaining. The six foot eight guard will surely be missed. Now stay put because when we come back, we'll recap the women's lacrosse team's regular season finale and preview the Big Ten tournament. And later, Nathan Schwartz will tell us which Terps might be hearing their names called at the NFL Draft this weekend. Don't go anywhere. There's so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years and I got my third child who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become, and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you. Welcome back to the Left Bench, brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central, Alex Gary, Alana Mutnick. And Alana, men's lacrosse wasn't the only team to end their regular season on a sour note. Yeah, Maryland women's lacrosse struggled mightily in Evanston this weekend. With a regular season title on the line, Maryland women's lacrosse couldn't pull through with a win on Saturday. The number 12 Terps fell to the number two Wildcats in its regular season finale, 13-6. Northwestern's Izzy Skane, the nation's leading scorer, scored the first goal of the game less than a minute into its start. Although the Wildcats scored the first three goals of the game, the Terps cut that deficit to 3-2 to two in the first quarter. The Wildcats regained a two-goal edge in the final seconds of the first period with a Northwestern free position score. Maryland opened the second quarter with two quick goals from Shaylin Ahern and Chrissy Thomas, tying it up. Both teams went on a scoreless run for the remaining 13 minutes of the half. Unfortunately for the Terps, going into the second half at four apiece didn't translate to the second. Northwestern scored five of its six goals in the third quarter, putting that at a 9-5 to five advantage over the Terps. Northwestern scored the first three in the fourth, and the Terps were unable to recover, falling to the Wildcats 13-6. to six. With the loss to Northwestern, the Wildcats will claim the top spot, while the Terps will come into the Big Ten tournament as the two-seed. Maryland will host the seven-seeded Buckeyes in College Park next Saturday. In their previous matchup this season, the Terps took care of business with ease behind a record-breaking eight-assist performance from Eloise Clevenger. If the Terps can repeat their dominance against Ohio State, they will meet the winner of Rutgers and Job Hopkins, two teams they were able to knock off in the regular season. Penn State came to town for a series with the Terps, and each game came down to the wire. Courtney Reich was absolutely dealing with from the circle early on, racking up K after K in Game 1. The Terps and Nittany Lions fought through scoreless innings until Maryland scored first for an Amelia Leck sack fly. Penn State would regain the lead, but a Trinity Schlotterbeck RBI left the game tied through seven innings. Penn State's Lexi Black hit a solo shot in extras and gave the Nittany Lions Game 1. Game 2 saw another low-scoring affair. The Nittany Lions got on the board first, but that would be all the scoring they would do in this game. Jada McFarland tied it, and a Kylie Goff sack fly gave the Terps the one-run lead. With no margin for error, error Megan McCamey made a stellar diving catch to keep the Terps up one, helping propel Maryland to a 2-1 to one win. Game 3 once again saw the Terps and Nittany Lions in a defensive battle. Amelia Leck got the bats going early for the Maryland with a solo shot in third. White continued to dish out K's but a two-run sixth inning gave the Nittany Lions a one-run lead. And from there, the Terps could not find an equalizer, dropped the game and series 2-1. to one. 
Well, I mean, we needed to come through. We had several opportunities to score some more runs, and we didn't get it done. And that's unfortunate, but but that's the way it goes sometimes. But that's all it is. This game was fairly evenly matched. Could have gone either way, and it went against us. Um, you know, we when you get chances, get runners on base, got to find a way to score. It was senior day for Maryland tennis on Sunday, and unfortunately for the Terps, they fell to the Buckeyes at the JTCC 0-4. Two of the seniors, Jojo Bach and Hannah McColgan, won their doubles 6-3, but unfortunately for the Terrapins, they just couldn't keep up with Ohio State, and Maryland Tennis was unable to secure a win in any of its singles matches. Maryland Tennis ended its season 16-8 and heads to Purdue next weekend for the Big Ten Championship. We have a couple days here to clean it up, and we're traveling Wednesday. Um, I think right now we're slated to play Indiana in, in the first round, and, and we beat them 4-3 at their place. So we got to clean a couple of things up. We'll have a couple different matchups, but you know, really jumping on that doubles point. And... After an impressive 2022 season that culminated in the Duke's Mayo Bowl win, Maryland football looks to build upon its success. Their first stop, the annual Red-White Spring Game this Saturday. The Terps offense took a big hit as only six starters will be returning. The potent receiving attack for the Terps is looking a little thin without big names returning, but Jay Sean Jones and Corey Deitches will lead the charge. Along with the receivers, rising sophomore Roman Hemby will continue to build on his impre impressive freshman campaign. And of course, QB1 for the Terps will be second team All Big Ten quarterback Talia Tugavailoa, looking to achieve even more in his final season. The defense looks to improve on their success last season as well, behind freshman All-American Jay Sean Barham and all Big Ten defensive back, Bo Braid. Last season, the Terps defense allowed their least amount of points scored since 2010 and look to continue their work in the trenches. The red-white game will be sure to be the litmus test for the Terps' success in the 2023-2024 season. Well, we certainly expected some Maryland football alumni to be on hand for the spring game on Saturday, but one alum was actually here last Saturday. Former Terp and three-time Pro Bowler Sean Merriman was back on campus for the Maryland Sports Business Conference, and he was stunting on everyone. Merriman looks like he could still play, but he spends most of his time these days promoting his Lights Out MMA events. And Alex, there are many other Terps who hope to have great NFL careers like Merriman. A few of them will start their journey Thursday night. That's right. The NFL draft is just two days away, and we're lucky to be joined now by Nathan Schwartz to give us an update on where some of these guys could be selected. Nate? Yeah, you guys, I think I'm looking forward to the draft just as much as the players right now because there's so much anticipation and guessing as to who will go where. And there are plenty of former Maryland stars that will have their names called this weekend. But the one that has the best chance of getting his name called in the first round is this guy right here, Deontay Banks. Banks has had meetings with nearly every team in the league and has been mocked as high as the mid-teens. NFL Network's Daniel Jeremiah has Banks as the 24th best player in the entire draft class, citing his excellent height, bulk, and length for the cornerback position as some of his best traits. In his Maryland career, Banks made 83 tackles, had two interceptions, and broke up 11 passes, eight of which came in his breakout 2022 campaign. Banks was extremely physical in breast coverage and very balanced overall in his Maryland career, making him one of the top cornerback prospects in the 2023 class. And let's take a look here at his 40-yard dash from the combine. He runs a 4-3-6, and this is what really allowed him to shoot up the draft boards the past couple months and will likely get him to hear his name called on Thursday night. Now this next guy is a player that was loved on this campus ever since he committed, and that would be Rakim Jarrett. Jarrett put on a show at CQ Stadium over his three seasons with the Terps, hauling in 119 passes for 1,552 yards and 10 touchdowns. Jarrett's best season came in 2021, which accounted for over half of each of those previous stats. But despite his production in a Maryland uniform, Jarrett isn't projected to go too high this weekend. Lance Zerline of NFL Network has a fifth to sixth round grade on Jarrett, citing his plus speed, athleticism, and after the catch ability as strengths, but his route running as a reason why he could fall. But Jarrett has made his way around the league for some visits, including a visit to Baltimore last Monday. So Banks is projected to go round one, Jarrett in round five or six, and then you got Jacorian Bennett, 
who, according to Jeremiah's top 150 prospects list, would slot right into the middle of the fourth round. Bennett, of course, had the game-clinching interception in the Duke's Mayo Bowl back in December and was phenomenal throughout his entire time with the Terps. Bennett became known as a pass breakup machine as you see some of his highlights from game one against Buffalo earlier this year. Bennett also had five interceptions on the season and 69 tackles over his three years with the Terps. But what really helped Bennett prove his worth this offseason were his performances in front of the scouts. Bennett ran an eye-opening 4-3-1 at the Combine in early March and intercepted a pass in the Senior Bowl, showing that he has the speed, size, and physicality to play at the next level. And now you don't see many kickers taken in the draft, but if there's any team looking for a kicker, and trust me, there's plenty, Chad Ryland is definitely a name on their draft board. Ryland has one of, if not the biggest leg in the entire NCAA. Ryland connected on 19 of his 23 field goal attempts in 2022, including three makes from 50 yards plus. Ryland also missed one extra point and had a 69.69 touchback percentage last year. With five years of college experience and quality hang time on his kickoffs, Ryland possesses the traits to get an opportunity at the next level. But will he get drafted is the question. There's only been one kicker taken in each of the last two drafts, and Ryland has some competition for the best kicking prospect this time around. And one more name to keep an eye on if you're a Terps fan is Jalen Duncan, the star left tackle for the Terps, who's likely to be get taken on day two of the draft on Friday. And you guys, ever since the draft changed to the seven-round format in 1994, the most Terps ever selected in one draft was five. And this year, I think there's a really good chance we could see that record broken. And I agree, Nate. This year could definitely be that year. Thank you so much. Now, don't go anywhere, because when we come back, we'll try and guess who said what. And as always, we'll name our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, and Top 5 plays. Stay with us. It's a dad, every day is a challenge. To make sure that the time that I have, I spend with them. It doesn't matter how tired you are, you have to try and to teach them. When they learn something new, and you can just see in their faces, it's, it's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are, that are my favorite. Welcome back once again to the left bench. I'm Alana Mutnik. That's Alex Gary. And before we crown our Terp of the Week and Pro Turk, we're excited to have Nathan here at the desk to play a little game we like to call Who Said What? Thanks for joining us, Nate. Yeah, just made the move over from Studio B to Studio A here. I'm excited to play this game with you guys. All right, let's do it. Long so trick, let's yeah. see it. You guys know how the game works. I'm going to give you four quotes from either a player or a coach. It could be a spring sport. It could be a winter sport. It could be a fall sport. Who knows? Ooh. I'm going to keep you on your toes. Right, let's uh, but let's get started with quote number one. So here it is. We were really professional in our approach. We were really relentless with our approach. And that's how you go and have a good night. Who said that? I'm going to take a wild guess and say Rob Vaughn. Alex, you have a guess? Rob Vaughn seems like the obvious answer here. It does seem like a baseball-related thing. But I'm going to say... That's too obvious. Rob Vaughn's a little too obvious. So I'm going to say maybe it's, maybe it's a player, and a player's got a lot of leadership. So I'm going to say I'm gonna say LaRusso. You overthought it. Rob Vaughn is yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you were on the right track. It is something Rob Vaughn would say, and that was after the James Madison win on Wednesday night. So, oh. Alana, you're one hey, for one. one nil. Alex, one nil. 0 for 1. All, All right. right, here we go. Number two. It's tournament time. So it is if you lose, you're done. So hopefully that sense of urgency helps. Okay, I, I do know this one because I remember hearing it. So I'll let Alana, Alana go first for this one. Uh, I just went first last time. I think right, I, fine, I, I uh, think you should take this one. This this Gepper, right? Do you have a guess, Alana? I. Let's go with the same thing. Let's go with the same thing. It's not Gepper. It is John Tillman. Really? It I would I would have never gotten that. And it I was after it was that. after the rivalry game. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it was an in intro video. Um, so, yeah. I remember Gepard saying something about the tournament, so I just locked in on that. Good you guess, should, good guess. Yeah. Well, I guess you should not have taken my advice. I, I should have done it. <laughs> right, I should have done it. it. You're still winning one to nothing. All right. Halfway through. All right, here we go. Quote number three. They had my back and I had theirs, and we played every ball out until it was in one of our sticks, and I think that's why we were successful. Okay, so it's lacrosse. 
So I'm going to stick with my gut and go with the coach. I'm going to say Kathy Reese. All right. I'm I'm a I'm a I guess triple down at this point. I'm gonna say they had my backs. It kind of makes me think of a goalie. I'm gonna say it's Sterling. Okay, you both you had the right sport. It was women's lacrosse. Alex, you were closer with the player, but both of you are wrong again. Mm. It's Shay Ahern. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, this was after the senior day Ohio State win for them. She was talking about uh the, on the draw control, mm, the right. team having her back. So. Half a point, though, for women's lacrosse. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that. Yeah, if we're doing half points, I don't yeah. know if we're doing half points, but right. we'll do it anyway. I, I need this last one. All right, last I need one. this last one. All right, I think you guys are going to like this one. All right, here we go. Like, you can go refocus. <laughs> Maybe you should, because I'm proud of this team, and this team is pretty damn good. So I'm not refocused. If anything, I'm celebrating, and we're going to have a big party on Sunday. Oh. Who said that, guys? The man himself, king of all quotes, <laughs> Coach Kevin Willard. <laughs> Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, it's, it's Willard. Yeah. Yeah. It's Kevin Willard uh, after the Indiana loss in the Big Ten tournament. Mm -hmm. Coach was asked if he needed to refocus. He was adamant he did not need to refocus. And then they went on to win an NCAA tournament game. So maybe they did do enough refocusing. I'm not really sure what happened there. But so you guys, you got two. You got one. Alana, mm -hmm. you're the winner. Let's go. Let's do it. Good job. You know uh, how does it feel, Alex? Doesn't feel the best, but, you know, I guess I, guess I got to do some more studying. Yeah, I think you do too. <laughs> well, thanks so much for, thanks so much for joining of us. Of course, right? thanks for having me, guys. Mm -hmm. After Maryland baseball secured yet another conference series win this weekend against Purdue, it seems only fair to crown one of the Dirty Terps our Terp of the Week. And it's going to no other than Eddie Hokopian. Friday night at the Bob called for Hokopian's third consecutive game with a home run following his sixth inning solo shot. His homer cut the Boilermakers lead to 7-2. Even though the Terps were unable to come out on top of the series opener, the 6-3 powerhouse helped further his team's Big Ten consecutive series win streak to 19. Hakopian added a two-run homer in Sunday's game against Purdue, propelling Maryland up by double against the Boilermakers. This was Hakopian's fourth homer in five games as he helped his team to a 10-8 victory against Purdue. Congrats, Eddie, for being our Terp of the Week. The XFL playoffs will begin this weekend, and one of the teams fighting for the throne is the Houston Roughnecks, or should we call them the Houston Terrapins, because their defense is manned by four former Terps. Sean Davis, A.J. Henley, William Likely, and Jordan Mosley all have contributed towards stellar defensive play from the Roughnecks all season. This unit shut offensive down this season with commanding play. The Roughnecks led the league in fewest yards per game, allowed with 271.4 per game, as well as the fewest pass yards per game with 186.4. Davis, Hendy, Likely, and Mosley have all contributed to this stellar defense and look to continue their dominance in the postseason. Congrats to our four Pro Terps this week. Well, it's finally time to show you our top five plays of this week. Please, Alex, go ahead and do the honors. Starting it off, it's Daniel Kelly shooting at the opposite side. What a snipe. Opposite side makes the goalie Quick reaction, just couldn't get there. Yeah, that's a great play right there. But now let's take a look at number four. We have Eddie Hakopian's two run homers in Sunday's game against Purdue. This was Hakopian's fourth homer in five games. And for number three, we have Emily Sterling with the point blank save. She knew right where to put it and she saved it right in time. And at number two, we have one of Braden Erks' four goals from Saturday, who had a career-high five points in the rivalry match. What an incredible shot. And number one, Megan Mikami coming up clutch. She dives, grabs it out of the air. And not only was this a, a grazing grab, this pretty much sealed the game for the Terps. What a play by Mikami. I mean, perfect positioning, just grabs it out of the air. Beautiful stuff by Mikami. Yeah, that is crazy. I could watch that last play over and over again. I mean, I, I, I just am in awe. Put right place, right time, just snagged yeah. it out of the she, air. She's incredible. <laughs> and that's going to do it for this edition of The Left Bench. TLB In Focus is back this Thursday, when Sam Jane and Ben Wolf will tell you all you need to know about the Maryland softball team. And don't look now, but there are two more full-length episodes left this spring. So keep up with all of Terrapin Sports Central's coverage on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and online at TerrapinSportsCentral.com. But before we go, Alex, this is our last time together up at the desk, so 
I just want to say it's been a pleasure working with you. It certainly has been a pleasure working with you too. And also before we go, I just wanted to extend a message to my mom. Happy birthday from the TSC crew. Have a great one, mom. And we'll see you all later.